on a deserted island and you could have one thing with you, uh, well, that's kind of what this algorithm is. Uh, if you can have one, any one algorithm that goes to memory, this is pretty much the one algorithm you need. Um, everything else you can kind of work around uh, doing things entirely in memory as long as you have external sort. Okay, so before we begin today, uh, I want to get uh, just make sure all of this is fresh in your mind. Um, so let's go through all of the operators we've talked about and just make sure that you guys remember what the memory requirements of each of them are. So how efficiently can we implement project? How much memory do we need to implement project? Just in terms of order of magnitude. One tuple. We only need to see one tuple at a time. Uh, project is a streaming uh, operator. What about select? One. Yeah. Uh, same deal. Streaming operator. We only see one tuple at a time. Bag union? Same deal. Order one. All right. What about join? Uh, what do you, uh, can you say, uh, speak up? Uh, O1, uh, the, the amount of memory re it requires is constant? Okay. Any other answers? I, I'm not disagreeing with you, by the way. Yeah. Right. So it depends on the algorithm. Which algorithm would have uh, constant, or could you name an algorithm that would have, a uh, join algorithm that would have constant memory re requirements? Nested loop, block nested loop, both of those have uh, constant uh, memory requirements. Any others? Index nested loop. Uh, in fact, pretty much any nested loop join is going to have constant memory requirements. Uh, same thing goes for uh, the same thing goes for external hash join, more or less. I mean, you can make sure that the bucket sizes are of reasonably constant size. Um, are there any, any uh, join algorithms that take more than that amount of memory? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so uh, grace hash join is going to take up an amount of memory proportional to uh, one of the two relations. Okay, what about uh, grouping? How much memory is that going to take up? Hmm? Uh, order n, uh, where n is what? The uh, number of rows in, in the input or the output table? Uh, I can come up with an example where for an arbitrary number of rows, I'll only get one output. I mean, in the worst case, it's going to be the, the number of input rows. Uh, but is there a better uh, way of describing it? Right, so it's the number of groups. Okay, distinct. Number of distinct values, same deal. Um, what about uh, sort? How much memory do we need for that? Okay, so for sort, we need the entire uh, amount of memory that we have available. Now, for three of these operators, uh, join, group, and distinct, there's some sort of trade-off because at least for some instantiations of the algorithm, it's super, uh, it, the amount of memory it requires is super small. And for other instantiations, it's super big. So what are we getting out of having uh, more memory? Why does, uh, why would we, uh, why would we want to throw uh, an entire relations worth of memory at a join algorithm? It makes it faster. Grace hash join is going to be way faster than nested loop join. Um, it's going to be way faster than external hash join too, if you can actually fit all of that in memory. Now, is there any algorithm, uh, can you think of any join algorithm that would work in uh, a constant amount of memory, but also uh, have the same kind of fast performance, potentially?
Hint, what's the topic of the lecture? Sort merge join, right. So uh, sort a, a merge join uh, gives us the, the memory that we want, uh, the memory, the tiny memory requirements. How much memory does it need? One tuple, well, one tuple from each side, yeah. Um, but it also has constant time performance in the size of the input, which is uh, as good as you're going to get for any of these algorithms. Now, that assumes all the data has been sorted, but um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Same thing goes for group and distinct. If the data is already sorted, you get constant memory and good performance. So basically, the, the, uh, the main takeaway from this exercise is that if you have a sort algorithm that works with arbitrarily small memory sizes, you can get away with, uh, without implementing any other uh, algorithms that go to disk. All you need to implement is, uh, is some sort of sort algorithm that is conscientious of how much memory you're using. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. A sort algorithm that uh, basically makes use of disk. OK, so we had some discussion on Piazza about this. How would I go about taking it? Uh, how would I go about uh, implementing a sort algorithm that doesn't uh, use up all of the, my memory, that doesn't use up an amount of memory that uh, is proportional to the amount of uh, of data that I have. Yeah. Okay, so the suggestion is to use something like merge sort. Start with a bunch of sorted runs and then kind of build that back up. Great. So this is the basis for what's called two-way sort. Um, and two-way sort has, uh, consists of two stages. Uh, in the first stage, all of your data is completely unsorted. And so the very first thing you need to do is start building up a basis for, uh, for so, uh, merging the data together. So in the first pass, you're going to load each page one at a time, and then you're going to sort that page, and then you're going to write that page back to disk. Really straightforward. Load, sort, flush. Load, sort, flush. And you're never required to have more than one page of memory uh, in uh, memory at a time. For every subsequent uh, pass, you're going to load two pages onto disk, and you're going to do a merge sort on them. Uh, whoops, one more button. Merge sort them together and flush them to disk. And if you do this right, you never need more than three pages of memory allocated at a time. So. This process is going to repeat a bunch of times. How many times? In? Log in. So log in. I'm going to go through the entire thing. I'm going to create, uh, keep making uh, sorted runs that are twice as big as the last one. So just to give you a really high level example of how this works, here's a bunch of data. I've got two records per page, and I want to sort all of my records. So I'm going to start by sorting each individual page. And then I'm going to repeatedly merge the pages together to create uh, sorted runs that are slightly longer than the previous, or that are twice as long as the previous stage. And I'm going to do that again, now creating two runs of size four. And then finally, everything's going to get merged together. All right, this is a little bit inefficient because we're only using four pages of memory, whereas we could be using more. So uh, how could we take advantage of having more memory? So for the first pass, uh, can we get, derive any benefit from having more memory available? Oh, come on. I know it's early in the morning. It's only 12, but... Hmm? 
Yeah, so you can load many, many pages all at once, and uh, that gives you much bigger buffers. So rather than sorting, uh, rather than having to do uh, three passes, you might be able to get away with two uh, or, or even one uh, pass. So sort bigger internal buffers. Um, for every subsequent pass, could we still take advantage of having more memory? So what's the limitation in, in the second pass? OK, so the limitation is how many uh, runs you've sorted, or how, many, how big your runs are uh, in phase one. Um, how much memory are we using in, in phase two? Two tuples for the input and one tuple for the output. Can we take advantage of having more memory? So what if we loaded multiple uh, pages or multiple runs in at once? What would that do to the total runtime, of, or the total number of phases that we need to perform? So let's say hypothetically I was to load um, four pages and merge four pages in one go, or four, excuse me, four runs of data, four sorted runs. So right now, I'm, uh, if I would have to do four, pa or four merge phases initially, but uh, so what is that? Uh, two, uh, 16, I, had, I start with 16 sorted runs. That'll take me four merge phases to get into one sorted run. What if I were to load uh, four pa uh, four what if I were to merge uh, four runs in one go rather than two? Get a little word space. So right now, I'm merging four, five, six, seven, eight. Right now, I'm merging two things at a time. So how many stages of merging am I going to need? Log n. Uh, what base? Log base two. Why two? Right, so I'm reducing it by half because I'm merging two pages at a time. So if I increase the base, uh, in other words, if I load three pages, or let's say four pages in at a time, merge four pages in at once, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, which I might want to do because the amount of... Uh, uh, because the amount of uh, memory I have is more, and my bottleneck here isn't the amount of uh, isn't the work done to merge the things. It's the work done to load the things into memory in the first place. So I merge four things at once, and how many phases do I have now? Log base four, even better. So in general, uh, if I have n pages of memory, uh, I can do uh, an n-way sort and get, uh, excuse me, for k pages of memory, and I want to do a k-way sort, uh, then it'll take me log n to the base k uh, round up passes, plus the initial stage. How many IOs are we going to use here? So how many page loads do we need to perform, or page loads and page writes? No, uh, number of pages in the data, uh, okay. 
Oh, let me. So it'll take me, uh, my first pass is going to take me, uh, I have eight pages, so I need to read those in, sort each individual page, and uh, write those pages back out to disk. Now, for a merge, pa uh, a merge pass, how many IOs is that going to require? How many page reads do I need to do to do one complete merge phase? N, yeah, so I have to read the entire, uh, my entire data in. Uh, how many output? Well, am I reducing the amount of data that I'm producing? No. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna have to read in n pages, and I'm going to write out n pages again. So every single phase, every single complete phase, uh, requires me to read n pages in and write n pages out. So by reducing the number of phases in total, um, I'm actually reducing the, oops, reducing the amount of I.O. by basically the in, reading the entire, uh, one entire uh, read of the relation and one entire write of the relation. Okay, um, so this is kind of the really high level algorithm. Um, are there any questions on uh, two-way sort? Yeah. I see. So how much are you loading into memory at a given time? Because in the final passes, the sorted runs are really big. Uh, the, the trick here is that you're not loading the entire sorted run at once, because you're only ever going to need to compare the two pages at the front of, uh, of, of the sorted run. So with merge sort, you're only, looking, you're only ever looking at the, the uh, you basically treat the entire, uh, the, the two inputs as queues, and you only ever look at the head of the queue. Uh, in effect, you're, you're, looking, you're only looking at one page at a time. As soon as you've emitted all of the records in one page, you load the next page in, but once, once you're done with a page, you're completely done with a page, and you never need to load more than one page in at a time. So the, the actual memory requirement is still constant, even though the, the data that you're reading from is much bigger. Does that address your? Any other, that was a good question, by the way. Uh, any other questions? All right, uh, yeah? Is there a limit for K? Um, so eventually you're going to get uh, hit some sort of diminishing returns. Um, there is some benefit to having multiple streams come in because you can overlap IOs. If you have multiple sources of uh, multiple disks, you can have one file on each disk. Um, and ultimately the, the main benefit is that you're merging more things together in one go. So you don't need to, um, I mean, one full round requires you to read the entire relation in and write it back out to disk an entire time. And for petabytes of data, that's huge. So, I mean, realistically, the bigger you can make K, the better. Um, and at least for the purposes of this class, um, I would be very surprised if you encounter any, uh, any, uh, any limitations that make it impractical to make k as big as you want. Um, in other words, you may, you may need to partition all of the data into uh, a bunch of blocks, but then you should be able to merge all of those blocks, uh, excuse me, uh, partition the data into a bunch of sorted runs, but then you should be able to load those sorted runs back in uh, 
pretty much all in one go. Uh, well, yeah, k, so k can be n over uh, n over your run size. So if you have k units of memory, or yeah, uh, k over your run, uh, the n over your run size. Yeah. Um, for architecturally, can K be represented by the bus size? Um, so remember that K is giving you two advantages. So first off, it's giving you I.O. parallelism, and that's, I think, what you're getting at. Uh, by having multiple pages loaded in, you're getting um, more records at a time, you're getting, you're getting more parallelism, and so hopefully it's faster that way. Uh, but remember, it's also giving you another advantage in that it's reducing the number of passes you need to do over the data. So from the first perspective, yes, completely. It's, uh, the bus size is, is a good model, or the, the, the width of the bus is a good model for this. But from the second perspective, um, even if it's slower to do one pass, with that, it's uh, the fact that you're reducing the number of passes is potentially going to uh, give you a much bigger improvement as well. Does that address your question? Anything else? Great. So this is kind of the high level algorithm. Um, if you implement this, perfect. Um, it, I guess what I'm saying is this is kind of, this is exactly what the reference implementation does uh, for project two. However, there is a cute little hack. Um, I'm not sure if the textbook describes it, but it's one that I, I really like because it's uh, probabilistic and I like probabilistic stuff. Um, and it allows you to reduce everything by one more pass in general. It uh, basically allows you to double the size of your uh, initial sorted runs. So the basic observation is that the only phase here that has a severe hard memory limit is phase one, where you're building these initial sorted runs. So here's the question. If we have n pages of memory, can we create sorted runs that are longer than n? Hint, the answer is yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be saying anything. So there's this algorithm called replacement sort. And the idea is, again, to create these runs of sorted data but rather than trying to keep, trying to build, uh, excuse me, trying to sort all of the data in memory at one time, the idea is to build a kind of working set and to do as much as you can with that working set for as long as you can. So you're going to start by building an output buffer and every time you add something to this output buffer, you're going to keep reading things into your working set. And as long as you keep reading things uh, into your working set that will go into the output buffer, you keep putting things into the output buffer. So in other words, you can think of this as kind of a lottery ticket. Every time I uh, I claim a lottery ticket, I use that lottery ticket to buy another one, which gives me another chance to put things in uh, to, to, to get more lottery winnings. And if my goal is to get lottery w winnings, not necessarily to have lottery winnings, that's a good strategy. Okay, that's kind of vague, so let me illustrate this through an example. So once again, the idea is that you have an input buffer and you have a working set, and you have an output buffer. And this output buffer has some sort of state. Basically, the state is the last uh, record ID that you put onto the buffer, where you're sorting by record ID. So in this example, um, uh, two values have already gone into the output buffer, five and three. And so I'm keeping track of what the last record that I put in there, in this case, five. 
Now, I want to create a sorted run. So I'm going to look at my working set, and I'm going to go through the elements of my working set, and, well, two can't go into that sorted run because I've already output um, a five. Five is bigger than two. On the other hand, the eight is bigger than five, so I can put the eight back into the, uh, I can put the eight onto the uh, output buffer. So I'm going to find the lowest value that can still go into this sorted run, and I'm going to put it there. And then I'm going to update my state. So now k, uh, the, the last thing that I output, uh, goes up to 8, because, well, I just output an 8. And I'm going to load another record in for my input buffer. I'm going to put that into my sorted list. And you can think of that kind of like a priority queue. So I'm going to put that back into my working set, and I'm going to sort my working set once again so that everything is in uh, ascending order. And I'm ba basically going to repeat this process. I'm going to keep adding new things, uh, finding the smallest value for my working set that can still go on to the, excuse me, that can still go on to the end of the output buffer. And at some point, I'm going to recognize that I don't have any values in my working set that can go into my output buffer. So I'm going to uh, finish the run, I'm going to flesh that to disk, and I'm going to start an entirely new sorted run. So in effect, in the worst case, in the wor very worst case, I'm going to go through my entire working set and produce, at the very least, an, a sorted run that's the size of my working set. But every time I write something into my output buffer, I'm getting another chance, another opportunity uh, to put something, uh, to, to increase the size of my working set by one, to increase the size of, of my output buffer by one. So on average, if you assume that the, the data is uniformly distributed, um, on average about half of the tuples that you read in are going to be uh, valid for putting onto the end of my working set, excuse me, for, are, are going to be valid for putting into the output buffer. So if I have uh, n pages of memory, basic, uh, well, simple arithmetic question for you guys, uh, if I have n pages of memory, and I, on average, half of the data that I read in is going to go into, uh, is going to also work for my output buffer, how many, uh, how many pages of sorted data uh, will I be able to generate with n pages of memory? Let's go through a quick... Uh, all right. I think... What is that, physics? Uh, way more interesting diagrams than I draw. All right. So, I've got n pages of memory. Let's call that n. So I load in a working set. Now in the worst possible case, all of the records that I load into memory here, that's one sorted run. But if I make my assumption there, on average about half of the, the half of the records, or the next batch of records that I read in, are also going to be legitimate uh, things that I can add to my sorted run. So after I've loaded n records in, how many on average uh, records will I've loaded in that I can make use of? Five million records, on average half of them give me Hmm? 2.5 million, did I hear? I know we're computer scientists, and I, I certainly can't do basic arithmetic, but... Hmm? N by 2, thank you. 
Now that, see, that's a good answer. That's a computer scientist's answer. You don't answer with actual numbers. You answer with formulas. N over two. So half of my records go in. Um, okay, great. So half, uh, half of my record, uh, excuse me, half again the number of records that I could produce After I've produced uh, n outputs, I get n inputs that could potentially be used for, for outputs. Great. But now I've also produced n more outputs. So as I'm flushing these guys to disk, how many more records will I get? n over 4. And as I'm flushing these to disk, n over 8. All right. What's the, how, how does the sequence converge? Uh, n plus n over 2 plus n over 4 plus n over 8. What's the, hmm? I, I think I, 2n, yeah. So after, so with n pages of memory, using this algorithm, I can basically get a sorted run uh, that is twice as big as the available memory, on average. That's, you know, probabilistic. We're not guaranteed to get that but we'll still be able to take advantage of it um, in, on average. Okay, and in the best case, what happens if the data is already sorted? Hmm? If my input data is already entirely sorted, then uh, I'll read the first, or I'll output the, le uh, the, the first record, I'll get another record that goes to the end of my working set. And I'll keep the working set basically acts as a queue. And if the data is already sorted, the entire thing can be done in one pass. Great side advantage of that algorithm. All right. Um, OK. So one last bit of recap. Like I said, if you have an external sort, you can do everything else using, uh, using a, uh, a sorted input. So if you, using a sorted input in a constant amount of memory. So last lecture we talked about joins. So if you have a uh, sort merge join, that's only going to require a constant amount of memory, uh, but it'll still have a performance that's linear in the size of your input data. Keep going and eventually produce the right output. Um, so between the sort operator and sort merge join, uh, you can implement join in a constant amount of memory with linear time in the size of your input data, which, like I said, is about, uh, excuse me, n log n uh, in the size of your data which is about as good as you're going to get for almost anything, except for, uh, well, it's about as good as you're going to get. All right, what about distinct? How would I go about implementing distinct? OK, so I sort on all my attributes. All right, now all of, my, uh, all of the paired attributes are next to one another, so I can just do a scan over the list. I never need to keep more than one thing in memory at a time, and I'm still able to produce a full uh, list of um, distinct outputs. Group by. Same thing. Um, I have a bunch of data. I sort it, and then I go over um, and I only need to keep one aggregate value in memory at a time because all of my groups are adjacent to one another. Okay. Um, well, before I do anything else, are there any questions on either two-way sort or um, this funky optimization that I described? Yeah. Uh, could you speak up? Sorry. 
Um, so replacement sort is basically two-way sort, but the first phase also has this extra um, little bit of stuff that gets you better, uh, longer sorted runs. Does that answer your question, or it, it, or could you be more specific? And, Ah, okay. Um, sure. So, let's do the example again. So, the idea is essentially that you have a working set that contains as much of a sorted run as you care to ha uh, as, as much of a sorted run as will fit in memory. But as you write things out to disk, you're essentially freeing up some memory. So as I write things out to disk, I read things in back into my working set. And so now my working set basically has two components, a component that can no longer go into the current sorted run and a component that can go into the sorted run. The component that can't go into the sorted run essentially acts as kind of a buffer and the start of my next sorted run while the component that can go into the current sorted run, well, I'll take one record out of that at a time, or one page worth of records out of that at, at a time, move that into my output buffer, and um, then use the space that that frees up to, uh, to load another uh, record or another page of records into memory. And then I'll try and put those, uh, I'll split those according to whether I can use them right now or not. Yeah? So, uh, in this case, uh, so when would the two get in? Uh, it will come in the next output buffer? When, uh, the question is, when would the two come in? So, eventually, this sorted run that I'm building right now uh, is completely full. So, at that point, I flush whatever last bits I have to disk, and start an entirely new sorted run. And two, assuming no other records came in ahead of it, two would be the first record output in that sorted run. Yeah? So the, the comment is that if the data, the, there's some, um, there are some cases, the assumption of uh, building sorted runs of length 2n is based on a uniform distribution. So if the data is unfriendly, like if it's in uh, reverse order, for example, uh, then you're not going to get the ben any benefit out of this algorithm. That's completely right. But the nice thing is that it's no worse than uh, just building sorted runs. You're always going to get at least n records into a sorted run. Um, and if the data is friendly, then you get better performance. Yeah? So this also, uh, you can parallel it with all the uh, first level runs, right? Yeah, so this, replaces, this essentially replaces the first stage of two-way sort. Or n-way sort, excuse me. All right, any other questions? Okay. Uh, uh, don't really have enough time to go too deeply into cost-based optimization. So I'm gonna stop here uh, with two, uh, let me finish with two pieces of information. So first off, uh, just a reminder, uh, March uh, is sneaking up on us surprisingly fast. Um, which means that next Wednesday is the first midterm. Uh, Monday we'll be going over the content for that to give you a bit of uh, study or give you a bit of uh, guidance on what to expect. But basically, if you've implemented Project One, if you've been um, preparing for Project Two, you should do perfectly fine. Um, everything is essentially going to be based on the ideas that went into Project One and the things that we've been talking about in the last couple lectures.
but again, we'll go over, uh, we'll do a full review of the, the material um, on Monday. The second thing, uh, to give you a heads up for project two, I'll try and have a very rough specification for that posted uh, by Monday, but the basic idea is it'll be project one with additional constraints. Um, there will be, uh, so the first constraint is that the time limit is going to be lower and you're going to have to deal with lots and lots of joins. So, well, the basic takeaway is that nested loop join is no longer going to be uh, sufficient for, your, uh, for, for producing output in a reasonable amount of time. The second thing is that in part two of, uh, so it'll be two parts of the project, one that basically has lots of joins, lots of, um, lots of joins with very little time. The second part, you're going to get a chance to, uh, you're going to get a, um, a directory where you can write to. So we'll pass an argument that tells you, uh, that, that gives you a temporary directory to write to, and will also be restricting the amount of memory that you have, have access to. Um, so Java has a uh, parameter dash mx, basically something that restricts the amount of heap space that you have access to. So uh, we'll be limiting you to something like 50-ish megabytes of memory, and we'll be feeding you really, really big files. So. Um, Essentially, the, the main takeaway here is that you're going to need something uh, analogous to either external sort or, uh, well, or you're going to have to implement, well, you'll need external sort one way or another um, because some of those queries have order by constraints. So basically, this, this lecture, this is half of project two. Okay, uh, that said, any final questions? Uh, the mid, the, the, the syllabus has the correct midterm date on it, or it, does it, am I, did, am I misspeaking? Uh, this, oh, sorry, the topics covered on the midterm will be basically, yeah, everything uh, external sort probably won't be on it, but everything through last Wednesday. Uh, everything through join algorithms, essentially. Um, but, uh, let's have a look. Um, uh, all right. So basically, uh, intro, uh, relational algebra, SQL, translating, evaluating, uh, extended relational algebra, uh, data modeling, and, uh, quer and query optimization, um, and probably not much in the way of indexes, but uh, indexes and join algorithms uh, may creep in. Okay. We'll, we'll cover all of the material on Monday, but basically everything through uh, the midterm. Fair game for the midterm is everything through February 25th. All right. Uh, see everyone. Have a good weekend.